on to the uh, next uh, item on our uh, schedule today. And we have a debate um, between uh, two speakers. But um, before starting and introducing our speakers, I just wanted to give everybody an idea of how this is going to work. Um, so the motion that will be debated today is uh, cognitive markers are more useful than biomarkers in MS monitoring. And debating for the motion, we have Dr. Anthony Feinstein. And debating against the motion, we have Professor Charlotte Tunison. Um, but before we start, um, we'd like to get an idea from the audience um, what you think about this motion to start. Then we'll have our debaters speak. Um, we'll have a discussion in the middle. Our debaters will then uh, close up their arguments, and then we'll have another vote to see if their arguments have influenced um, what you think of the motion at all. So can I ask the audience, um, what do you think about this motion? Um, are you for it or against it? Cognitive markers are more useful than biomarkers in MS monitoring. For those for the motion, if you can raise your hand, please. Okay. And for those against the motion, if you could put up your hands, please, as high as you can. Right. Um, so at the end of this session, we'll take another vote um, to see how our uh, speakers have influenced your decision. So I'm uh, going to introduce both of our speakers now. I'm uh, delighted to introduce to you uh, Dr. Anthony Feinstein, who is a neuropsychiatrist and professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. Um, you all know uh, Dr. Feinstein, and he has contributed substantially to the field um, by uh, researching the cerebral correlates of depression and disorders of affect, as well as uh, evaluating cognitive dysfunction in MS, and is the lead investigator of the COGEX trial, which is an international study um, that uh, looked at uh, treating cognitive impairment in people with progressive MS using aerobic exercise and cognitive rehab. And I hear from Anthony, we'll be um, hearing about the results of this trial pretty soon. But one thing that many of you probably uh, do not know about Anthony is that um, he has a whole another life outside of the MS world, um, where he spent uh, decades uh, studying journalists in conflict situations, and he's actually a consultant for a number of news organizations, including the New York Times, CNN, and uh, the Globe and Mail. He's also a celebrated writer, and I know I'm embarrassing you, Anthony, but has written a number of books on this topic, topic including um, In Conflict and Shooting War. And he even produced a documentary a number of years ago called Under Fire that won a Peabody Award and was long listed for an Academy Award. Um, so Dr. Feinstein will be debating for the motion. And then I'd just like to also introduce uh, uh, Professor Charlotte Tunison, um, who will be debating against the motion. Um, professor Tunison is a full professor in neurochemistry at Amsterdam UMC and aims to improve care of people with various neurological diseases, including MS, by developing uh, fluid biomarkers for diagnosis, stratification, prognosis, and monitoring treatment responses. Studies of her research group span the entire spectrum of biomarker development, um, starting with biomarker identification, followed by assay development and validation, and extensive clinical validation to ultimately implement novel biomarkers in clinical practice. And I couldn't think of someone better um, to debate against this motion. So Dr. Feinstein, if you could start, please. Good, so thank you. Thank you for this uh, invitation and my compliments to the committee for pulling off this meeting under difficult circumstances. So judging by the voting, I've got my work cut out for me. I've got 15 minutes to try and get the majority of people to change their minds. These are my disclosures. So I'm going to give you 10 reasons why cognition is so important for people with multiple sclerosis. But first, by way of introduction, let me start off with Charcot, who in the 1870s made the point that cognition was impaired in people with multiple sclerosis. Um, there was an enfeeblement of memory, there was a slowness of response. And then for about 100 years, the field went quiet. There wasn't a whole lot written about things, and it all changed with the advent of brain MRI. And you can see there a scan from someone with MS, a CT scan, you don't see a whole lot. And then with the MRI, the T1 and the T2 weighted images, you suddenly see the lesions come into view. And around this time, there was a great uptick in interest in cognition. And what do we know now? Well, there's going to be a broad array of deficits, things like verbal fluency, visual spatial perception, verbal and visual memory, processing speed, 
And indeed, that's the cardinal cognitive difficulty that I will return to repeatedly in my talk. There are multiple ways to assess cognition, and neuropsychologists got together for a consensus statement over here, and they came up with this battery called the MACFIMS, looking at processing speed with the PACER test, the simple digit test. I'll show you what they look like. Tests of verbal memory, visual memory, spatial memory, executive functioning. This whole battery takes about two to two and a half hours in people with multiple sclerosis, and that's just too long for routine clinical practice. So there's now a consensus, the BICAMS, Brief International Cognitive Assessment in MS, it takes about 10 minutes, and they borrowed from this consensus using the simple digit modality test and tests of verbal and visual memory. But even 10 minutes is a long time for a busy neurological practice. And so we have the simple digit modality test, which is now the sentinel cognitive measure. If you have to choose one test for people with MS, use the SDMT. And this is what it looks like. The person is given a page in which you've got the code up here, numbers one to nine, nine different symbols. And your task over 90 seconds is to match the symbol with the numbers as quickly as you can go. Very straightforward, very easy. Um, the recommendation now, consensus recommendation, is that people with multiple sclerosis should at least have the simple digit at baseline and probably once a year to monitor their cognition. And to make this even simpler for physicians, we've developed a voice recognition simple digit using Google software that's in the public domain and the computer does the testing. You don't even have to have a tester within the room. And you can see over here that there's very good concurrent validity between the traditional SDMT and the computerized version, both in healthy controls and in people with multiple sclerosis. I just want to say a quick word about another test of processing speed, the PACE-SAT, because it is part of the multiple sclerosis functional composite. It's a more complex task. Numbers are called out. The first number five, the next number four. You have to add them up. The total is nine. And the next number that comes up, you don't add to the total, but to the last number. And so the answer would be 12. The next number comes up, you don't add it to the total, but to the last number, 9. So there's an element of distraction in it, and it's a difficult task, and people with multiple sclerosis don't like it. They become anxious and they perform poorly because of anxiety. So this test is slowly giving way to the simple digital modality test. So how common is cognitive difficulties in people with MS? And you can see that as the disease progresses, it becomes a lot more common. So clinically isolated syndrome, 34%, relapsing remitting, 44%, and as you get into the progressive disease categories, very high rates of cognitive impairment. These are data from G1's clinic in Toronto, where even individuals with radiologically isolated syndrome have cognitive impairment. So you've got the MRI that's abnormal, no other clinical symptoms, but their cognition is impaired. About 33% of these individuals indeed have cognitive difficulties. And even in the category called benign multiple sclerosis, well, it's not benign from a cognitive perspective because 30 to 40 percent of people will have cognitive difficulties as well. So that's the groundwork for the 10 points that I want to make why cognition is so important. So the first is this. These were data that I collected in Maria Ron's lab at Queen Square when I was doing my PhD, and it goes all the way back to the 1990s. And we've got a group of individuals from Moorfields Eye Hospital who were had optimitis and they'd been symptomatic for two weeks, so very acute sample. And we put them through a scan of 0.15 Tesla MRI, and we ended up with three groups. We have a group of healthy controls, optimitis with a normal MRI, optimitis with an abnormal MRI, very acute with two weeks of symptom onset. And you can already see that in the group with the abnormal MRI, you've got some cognitive problems with the pegboard test the symbol digit modality test, and the PACE-SAT. So processing speed deficit very early on. So why is this important? Well, individuals with clinically isolated syndrome who have cognitive impairment will convert more rapidly to multiple sclerosis. And this has been replicated many times. And we see the study over here, follow-up period of 3.5 years, 46% converted. When you've got cognitive difficulties, the rates go up significantly according to the number of failed cognitive indices. The second point is this. What happens in relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis when you've got cognitive difficulties? Well, this group is more likely to convert into secondary progressive MS. And you can see 
the odds ratio is over here. And in fact, with this cognitive impairment, it also increases the risk of mortality. So the hazard ratio goes up, which you see very nicely over here. We see a group without cognitive impairment, the group with impairment. Here we've got survival curves in relapsing remitting MS. The decline isn't that steep. But certainly in progressive MS, we see a very big difference. But people will die earlier if they've got cognitive problems. The third important point is that we now know there are cognitive relapses. And you can see this over here with the simple digit modality test. We've got two groups. The green group is pretty stable over time. Here's the STMT scores. Slightly increase over time because of practice effects. Here we've got the group that goes through a relapse. And you can see how the STMT scores go down and then come up in remission. And in fact, that's mirrored by the score on the 25 foot time walk, which gets worse and then gets better. But other cognitive indices change as well. Verbal memory, for example, goes down with a relapse and then improves. But now we have the fourth point. You can have an isolated cognitive relapse with no other neurological symptoms. And how do we know this? Here we have individuals that go through GAD scans. They're clinically asymptomatic. We've got the group over here that's gadolinium positive, positive, and we see how the SDMT scores goes down and then picks up again when they're GAD negative. And this is in the absence of any other neurological difficulty. So cognition becomes a good marker of disease course and progression. What about brain imaging, which will be, I'm sure my colleague will speak about this as a very important um, uh, marker of disease. Well, this is an old paper that's forgotten. It's a Stephen Rayer paper from 1985 and was CT scan, not an MRI. And what Stephen showed very nicely is that when there's atrophy in people with progressive MS, measured by the width of the third ventricle, then performance on memory testing goes down. So you've got three groups over here, no atrophy, mild atrophy, more marked atrophy, and we can see how the memory impairment on word retrieval, word recall goes down, and also with items recall go down here as well. So a very simple marker on CT scan, and when we fast forward by 40 years to the age of MRI, we have here an individual with relapsing rheumatic MS, secondary progressive MS, they both had the disease for 14 year duration, same slice cut, and we can see how the third ventricle atrophies. And why is this important? Because either side of the third ventricle, we have the thalamus. And the thalamus has emerged as the most robust imaging correlate of cognitive difficulties. And this is a nice study done by my colleague Ralph Benedict who looked at multiple brain metrics, and he showed that it was really the third ventricle width that correlated very nicely with the SDMT, the PACEAD, visual verbal memory, and you can see, you know, really reasonable partial R correlation efficiency over here. And to stay with this theme, this is a lovely study from Frederick Barkov's group looking at a representative sample of people with MS relapsing remitting, secondary progressive, primary progressive, and he gave them this broad consensus neuropsychological battery, verbal memory, visual memory, processing speed, executive functioning, and he showed deficits in people with multiple sclerosis across the board. And then they had a look at multiple brain indices, whole brain, white matter, gray matter, deep gray matter, lesion volume, cortical thickness, juxtacortical lesions, cerebellar lesions, and the severity of diffuse white matter change. And what did they show? Once again, deep gray matter atrophy is a very powerful predictor of cognitive problems, plus diffuse white matter damage through diffusion tensor imaging fractional anisotropy metrics. Another useful brain marker, neurofilament light, also correlates well with cognition. The second point to make is this, and this I think is the most powerful, is that you have multiple real-world indices that will correlate with cognitive dysfunction. Basic activities of daily living, bathing, unshelving food, opening containers, using utensils, appliance operations, even making a bed, will be impaired in individuals with cognitive dysfunction. What about driving? You know, this is a big issue when you take away someone's driver's license, but impaired cognition is a strong correlate of driving difficulties, in particular processing speed on the SDMT. But other aspects of cognition as well will affect people's ability to drive. What about forgetfulness to take your disease-modifying therapy? Probably the biggest reason why people don't take their medication is because of cognition. They forget. And that, of course, can have major implications for the disease. And then finally, unemployment. And this is nice data from Dawn Langdon, Royal Holloway, 
a nice um, systematic review. If there's no disability, then you're not going to have unemployment linked to MS. If you've got high disability and EDSS was 6.5, the unemployment rate is very high. But when you look at this group over here with an EDSS of less than 3, so you know, mild to, to, to modest disability, 54% are unemployed because of cognition. Deficit in processing speed, immediate delay for memory and executive functioning. So the eighth point, we now have cognition as a marker of clinically significant change. We know that a four-point change in SDMT is going to have bad repercussions for individuals with MS, potentially affecting their employment. And these are, these are group data. On an individual basis, an eight-point change in the SDMT can have real-world consequences. So when we test our patients seriously over time and we have a look at the magnitude of change, that now correlates with real-world implications, your ability to sustain a job, for example, maintain employment. What about cognition as a predictor of cognition, cognitive reserve? And I love this quote from a, a best-selling author in Victorian times, Samuel Smiles, said, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, but all play and no work makes something worse. And so we have to find this balance between play and work. But when we have intellectually enriched lives, that boosts our cognitive reserve, and that's good for our cognition. And we see this very nicely in this graph over here, that as the disease burden goes up, if we've got high cognitive reserve, good pre-morbid IQ, we take part in leisure activities, we come from an intellectually enriched environment, we play music, we read, this is all good for brain health and is protective. And we're able to quantify this. And this is a very nice study from James Samowski showing this very well. We've got here various metrics of intellectual enrichment. We've got a group over here with good cognitive reserve, modest cognitive reserve, low cognitive reserve. Here we have an index of cognitive efficiency, which is simple digit scores and pay set scores. Here we have memory, and we can see that in the low cognitive reserve, many more deficits and the slope is much steeper than it is in people with high cognitive reserve. So their rate of decline is much quicker. And this is all, of course, a statistical construct. We know that data are normally distributed, the Gaussian distribution for cognitive data. Here we've got the mean. 1.5 standard deviations below that is indicative of impairment. But if you've got high cognitive reserve and you're starting from this part of the bell curve, 1.5 standard deviations does not take you into the impaired range. You've got this protective factor from cognitive reserve. So the final point to make is this, and I think this is in many ways the most powerful argument. Cognition is a marker of function in a real world full of fast-paced distractions. And here we have William James and his famous book, The Principles of Psychology, and he comes up with this great notion that everybody knows what attention is. And having you know, garnered our attention, he doesn't really trust us, and he goes on to explain exactly what attention is. And he brings in the whole question of distraction. And of course, we know about distraction. The poets know about it. Wordsworth wrote about this 80 years before James in his very well-known poem. The world is too much with us. Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. And what was Wordsworth saying? That mankind had become enthralled to things, to objects, to the material age, and they were losing um, contact with nature all around them. And the great writer saw Bello built on that. We are in the state of radical distraction. And he was doubtful that technology could liberate us from what he called the tyranny of noise and distraction. And he made reference to Wordsworth. Wordsworth warned that we lay waste our powers by getting and spending. Bello said it's more serious than that now. And he wrote this in the 1970s. What would they make of our world now with Twitter, Flickr, Instagram, email, social media, and most importantly, how do people with multiple sclerosis who have cognitive difficulties navigate through the complexities of modern life? So we tried to address this experimentally. We developed a computerized SDMT, numbers from one to nine, nine different symbols. We have the symbols in a different order over here, a buzz of sounds, and the person has to match the symbol with the numbers as quickly as they can. When they get to the ninth symbol, it goes blank and is replaced by another line in the eight iterations. This is how we generally test people for cognition. We put the sign up on the door outside saying quiet, testing in progress. 
And this is not the real world. There's no tyranny of distraction with this. So what we did, we built in distractors. Telephones ringing, car horns, background noise of people talking. And here's the data. Here we see healthy controls, time over here. Here we've got the group without distraction. Here we've got the group with distraction. Even in healthy controls, we can see that people are going to get slower with distraction. And here we have the individuals with multiple sclerosis, significantly slower, and the divide between the two is much greater. And my final slide is this, that even in the context of high cognitive reserve, which is protective, the distractions become a problem. So the traditional SDMT, a failure rate of 30%, you bring in distractors, it goes up to 47% failing this test. With high cognitive reserve, the failure rate is 15%, half of what it is over here. And you bring in distractions, and it ratchets up three times to about 40%. And so this is, you know, this is, this is important data. These are the lives that people lead with cognitive difficulties. They can get derailed by distraction with all the real world implications that's got for them. So having made these 10 points, I rest my case, and I pass it over to my colleague. So I have no slides, uh, but I made some notes for myself. Uh, but yeah, it's um, a very convincing uh, plea that you gave, um, but, but the only Seeing the audience response, I think I can only do harm, <laughs> and I hope that um, I, I will uh, go through it. So, uh, what are biomarkers by definition? I think that's uh, maybe one uh, of the main arguments, because they are an objective tool. So, they are objective measurements of a normal biological state or a disease state. So, the objectivity is a very important point. And for, um, yeah, we can use uh, the biomarkers uh, for diagnosis. Uh, we use the radiological biomarkers for a diagnosis and also CSF biomarkers. Uh, the blood-based biomarkers in MS are not that advanced or do not give that much additional value uh, that they add specificity for the diagnosis of MS. But uh, the fluid biomarkers, which uh, I'm uh, mostly working on, uh, we can use them very well for monitoring of treatment responses in MS. Uh, so, and by that, they, they give an objective indication of the current state of a patient. So we have very good biomarker neurofilament lights, um, and which has uh, been shown to be consistently a decrease upon successful treatment across various studies. Uh, so there is some evidence for the use of those biomarkers. Um, but maybe we should, um, yeah, I can also reflect a little bit on the cons um, to use cognitive outcomes in trials. Of course, it's close to the experience, the clinical experience of the patient. So it's very important to have cognitive biomarkers. Um, and at the end, a definition of a, a surrogate biomarker, if you want to use a fluid biomarker or a radiological biomarker, um, as a surrogate biomarker, it, uh, the definition is to replace a clinical outcome, which is cognition. So we can't do without cognitive tests, yet we are uh, searching very quickly or, or continuously with a lot of effort uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, generate also fluid biomarkers. And why? Well, uh, we've seen it also in the pre uh, presentation of, of uh, Professor Feinstein. There, is a, there was always a clinical radiological paradox. Uh, we can extend it to clinical biomarker paradox. Because there are changes in cognition that uh, are unnoticed or, or not detected uh, by gadolinium enhancing lesions or by, uh, by radiological atrophy, which is a cumulative process, or by the dynamic changes in blood or in CSF. But for CSF, we can't measure too many dynamic changes because repeated CSF sampling is um, not so often done for obvious reasons. Um, yet, on the other side, there are uh, changes in, uh, yeah, in, in the biomarkers that are not related to changes in cognition. That's, that's to be expected. 
So due to this clinical uh, radio uh, biomarker paradox, uh, I think we should rely on the biomarkers uh, because the biomarkers are the objective tools and they give insight of the dynamics in a, in a person. Uh, and uh, one other reason why we should rely on those biomarkers is because cognitive skills are often quite inaccurate and they're uh, prone to learning effects. And that's what we see in Alzheimer's disease. That's my other subject. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's inherent to uh, cognitive tests. Yet the biomarkers can be measured uh, yeah, objectively every time by a machine, more or less. Um, and the other argument is that there is evidence. We do have evidence that nerve-emet light can be used to track uh, yeah, changes or treatment responses, positive treatment responses, and it's also a prognostic biomarker for disease progression. Uh, another upcoming biomarker is GFAP, which is also related to disease progression. There's evidence for that. So there's evidence for use of those biomarkers. And lastly, very important argument is also the cost. A biomarker analysis is usually done by, and especially the fluid biomarkers, is usually very cost effective. Um, so for example, Nervomet Light, you can measure it for 55 euros. Uh, similar for GFAP, it's a bit cheaper still. And then you have your uh, result already. So that is not, uh, yeah, it's very easy. And what's also very easy is that uh, you can obtain those uh, samples, the blood samples, uh, even at the corner of the street, at the GP office. And uh, once we start to use those biomarkers more and more, we can increase the scale of the technologies also and to implement them in uh, GP uh, laboratories as well. I don't know how Great Britain is organized, but in the Netherlands uh, we have academic laboratories and we also have gen, uh, primary care practice laboratories. And these are uh, yeah, organized in a way to, for central an analysis uh, for, uh, to serve the GPs. So why don't we have them yet, or, uh, biomarkers for cognitive decline? And we are still in the research phase. I think that's due to two reasons maybe more, but two main reasons. Uh, the, the cognitive uh, aspect uh, has gained only uh, more and more attention recently. Uh, so the research area is only emerging. Another reason is that uh, we only have uh, access to very sensitive uh, fluid biomarker analysis uh, tools only since recently. So it's uh, both are young fields and we need to study it more. Another reason could be <coughs> that um, co yeah, cognition anyway is difficult to grasp, um, and uh, although it's very relevant, but also in Alzheimer's disease, uh, we, we lack biomarkers to track cognition very well. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, again, neurofilament light is a good biomarker to track changes in cognition, both in MS and AD. So it could be a more general biomarker for cognitive decline, for changes in executive function, for example. We see that also in the normal aging population. Uh, what could be, in my opinion, a better substrate for real cognitive decline is uh, biomarkers for synaptic function. And uh, these are ideally measured in the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, there is only one marker, synaptic biomarker, that I'm aware of uh, that you can measure in blood, which is uh, beta synuclein, and that's an upcoming biomarker. Um, but for, uh, furthermore, in, or, or otherwise, we have to rely on CSF analysis for the synaptic biomarkers. And looking through the literature, there's barely any studies done outside the Alzheimer's field. Yet synaptic dysfunction and synaptic biomarkers, they are not specific for any of the fields. So I think we need to do more studies in CSF uh, to study synaptic uh, biomarkers because these are probably the direct substrates of cognitive decline. And hopefully uh, there will be other emerging biomarkers uh, that we can measure then also in blood, similar as uh, beta uh, so that we can use blood uh, in those cases. Um, <coughs> and uh, the, the progress is probably possible through 
uh, novel technologies, novel antibodies, novel assays being developed, some more research to be done. Um, we are in a good area uh, because nowadays we have very nice novel technologies at our disposal uh, for the identification uh, of novel biomarkers as well as the measurement in blood. Um, for example, the measurement in blood, we use uh, very sensitive technologies, uh, SIMOA mostly, and that's a, that's a relatively novel technology. Um, so only NFL and GFAP, those assays are available and we use them. So what, uh, I expect more to come if we have all the assays that are uh, available and, and uh, uh, implemented on the SIMOA technology. Another technology for identification, um, yeah, there's also a revolution going on. There are more um, possibilities than there were in the past. For blood uh, biomarker identification, uh, yeah, we, we could not rely on mass spectrometry, which, which is uh, historically the method of choice for novel biomarker identification. But that is very sensitive to variations in the pre-analytics, uh, so results were not consistent. But nowadays, there are more arrays uh, built on uh, the, yeah, also the principle of immunoassays uh, through which we can measure thousands of different proteins within the blood plasma, blood serum as well, uh, in, in a reliable way. And this will help us uh, for the development and identification of novel biomarkers and also biomarker tests. So the screening methods, they have been very successful already. We applied one of them, the ODING technology, uh, for our studies in dementia, uh, where we identified uh, several novel biomarkers for dementia. Um, and, and we were successfully able to uh, develop single panels for five of the, of the top biomarkers in a relatively short time. Uh, that, and we could replicate our original findings. And that was never the case uh, up to now in the mass spectrometry findings. So it looks like a successful approach. So I'm quite uh, yeah, confident that at the end we will have more biomarkers for cognitive change. And um, yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I rest my case. I think uh, the, the biomarkers uh, are, are fantastic tools. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you to both uh, Anthony and Charlotte for uh, presenting some <coughs> compelling arguments. Um, we will have another vote um, after um, both of our speakers have an opportunity um, to sum up their motions. But in the meantime, um, we'd like to open um, to the audience for any questions or discussion. And if both of our speakers could come back to the podium. Yes, right here. Hi, thanks. It felt to me as an MS patient, as if you were talking about two entirely different things. Professor Feinstein about how I feel, how I think, how I worry, how I'm changed, and none of them are wrong, but just measuring something empirically tells you nothing about me, the person. And it doesn't, no, neither of you mentioned behavior, which is something that is just a worry for many patients, is, is my behavior changing, which is harder to measure than how good am I at a particular test. And I was wondering to what extent the, the sort of empirical biomarkers that Charlotte's talking about actually apply to real world patient experience. Well, you know, I was asked to address cognition as it stands. There's another whole area of behavior, mood, depression, anxiety, etc., which is a subject of a different talk. Um, Absolutely. I mean, there are profound changes in behavior in people with multiple sclerosis. Rates of depression are very high. Lifetime prevalence rates are up to 50%. Anxiety probably even higher. And we know that can have a very significant effect on a person's quality of life. When you look at the metrics of what determine quality of life, if you're depressed, it's very hard to have a quality of life. So yes, there is a big aspect to behavior that wasn't addressed. But I kept the blinkers on because I was asked to speak about about cognition, but, but you're quite right. The, the whole behavioral aspect of MS is a lot broader than cognition. Can I ask uh, Charlotte, um, do we have any data about uh, fluid biomarkers and um, you know, kind of the patient's experience? Because I think this is a really important point that 
when we focus on you know, the, the utility of some of these fluid biomarkers, we often focus on the traditional measures of clinical disease activity. Uh, to be honest, I'm not aware of such studies. Yeah, so it's yeah. uh, relevant. Oh, Klaus mm -hmm. knows one. I mean, <laughs> and I, I'm not aware of studies like that either, so I yeah. think an important area for future research. Yeah. Um, yes, over on the left. Thank you very much uh, for this interesting uh, debate. Uh, 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 my worry is that what we are trying to measure here or, or, or debate is actually theory against pragmatism because what we see in patients with MS is just distorted signal that goes through damaged tissue and the brain being a processor doesn't process that properly. Hence we've got the rubbish data in so we've got rubbish data out and we can measure that by a variety of tests that, that were presented. Now how do we, because whatever biological markers are going to be that are going to follow this damage. Like my worry is how are you going to measure brain plasticity, learning and abilities because that's the brain function. It's lovely to see biomarkers in how we define MS itself. You can see <coughs> plaques, brain atrophy, whatever have you. But how do you actually measure its function in, in, in a sort of biomarker way, mathematical, algorithmic way, so as we could measure that nicely? I don't think it's just possible to have a biomarker of, uh, 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 of this type. So what do you think? Um, now, yeah, uh, at the end, the proof, uh, yeah, will be generated in time, and maybe you're right, and uh, we're wrong. Um, but, but, but I do think that we're able to uh, to measure it uh, at the end, uh, because those changes within the brain, they are biological changes. Uh, so, um, yeah, we should be able to, to grasp them, of course, and uh, due to the a quick turnover uh, of, of CSF proteins and CSF itself and also for blood, uh, yeah, we, we need to, uh, yeah, we are also dependent on a lot of uh, issues, uh, for example, the metabolism of, of the marker, the half-life of it. Uh, so I won't say it's easy. If it was easy, we had found already many biomarkers already. Um, one of the complicating issues is also the, the outcome measure, to, uh, where you're relating to, what are, what's your golden standard. And uh, I don't think we have the perfect uh, outcome measure yet, uh, due to the inaccessibility of the brain uh, during life. So it's not easy, but uh, yeah, I, I think with uh, continuous efforts and uh, novel possibilities um, at the end, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just faithful that we get there. Uh, one, one comment I want to make to, uh, for um, uh, inspection of post-mortem uh, material, for example, and because there you can really measure the, the changes uh, within the brain that are occurring, uh, but these are end stages also. And uh, so it doesn't give a reflection of what's happening at the time of the diagnosis. Uh, and yeah, there is a, and yeah, it's good to be aware of that because the majority of the CSF and blood-based biomarker studies are uh, performed in samples that have been collected in the earlier stages and also in progressive MS, but often not so shortly be uh, before that. So there can, there can be a change in the biology during this last period of life. Uh, so that that hampers the research. So, yeah, with, with cancer, you can look into the tissue uh, yeah, re in real time, and you can take a biopsy, but uh, in MS, we just can't. I, I mean, I would argue that, that with cognition, we're getting some very good uh, real-world markers of how people function. And you know, the field is moving towards being able to quantify their change. So I spoke about, with the simple digital modality test, that if you've got a four-point change, that's not clinically significant. If you bring a patient back for testing and their SDMT score has gone down by four points, that's going to have real implications for ability to sustain work or to manage activities of daily living. So, you know, we're starting to get these um, good ecological data from cognition. Plus, what I never spoke about over here is that, you know, you mentioned brain plasticity. There's this whole world now of functional brain imaging linked to cognition where we can actually map 
the neural networks, the functional neuroanatomy of processing speed. And that's been done in healthy people. And then we can apply it to multiple sclerosis and we see how dysfunctional the networks become. But that's also a living process. So as the disease evolves, we can track the way the functional networks change. And as people potentially recover some of their cognitive abilities after a cognitive relapse, we can start seeing how those neural networks reconstitute. So we've got some very good handles now on cognition in terms of brain plasticity and how it translates into real world function. Dr. Feinstein, so thanks for the debate, uh, interesting topic. Uh, just to mention, from, from attending um, cognitive clinics and neuropsychology and occupational therapy, I think unless you do the extensive testing, it's very hard to um, account for things like behavior, pre-morbid state, things like that. And my, I think, uh, do you think there's a problem with simplifying the test that we will you know, you will get people who will not put the effort, who will know that if you lose four points state, you know, they can get benefits or, or, you know, leave their job and things like that. And, and that's, I, I see this as a problem with simplified testing. It's a great question. I mean, you know, there is the consensus broad battery in which we look at multiple aspects of cognition, um, which gives us the best kind of data. The message that we get from our colleagues in neurology who run very busy practices, no one's going to do two hours of testing in a busy neurological service. So you kind of cut it down to the bicams, which is 10 minutes. And the message we get is even 10 minutes is too long in a very busy clinic. And so there's this enormous pressure to find the cognitive test that represents the complexity of all these issues. And you know, that's certainly a reductionist approach to the complexities of life. But the simple digit modality test is a good test. It tells us a lot about processing speed, and processing speed is certainly relevant for multitasking, for working memory, for aspects of executive functioning. And the SDMT is quick, it's 90 seconds. And then to try and make it standardized so it doesn't vary from clinic to clinic or from tester to tester, we start using computers to do it for us through voice recognition Google software. And that's highly standardized. So it doesn't matter whether the person's tested in your lab or mine, we know that they're gonna get exactly the same test and hopefully the data starts taking on added meaning because of that. But the broader question is you're quite right. You, know, you can't reduce the complexities of human existence to a 90-minute SDMT. But those are the pressures you now face within clinical medicine has come up with the one test. Yes. Um, this is a bit of a comment, and, and uh, I would like the, your opinions about the comment. In, in this, in this uh, set, uh, there is an, uh, an underlying problem. There is the dogma of objectivity only with technology. The clinical world doesn't work like that. The tests that are being produced are scientifically done to be objective. So when data is presented about the connection between a disease process uh, and its symptoms or manifestations, is just as objective as a technologically obtained result. That's the first problem. The second problem is what is a biomarker for? Biomarkers are sometimes simply an indication that the diagnosis is correct. A totally different affair is how well a biomarker marks the disease. And that's where the problem is, whether it, a, a functional study like the one that we presented first marks the disease and its evolution, and whether ever a single substance, a single chemical, will actually comply with that. That is what is underlying this debate. This dogma of objectivity applied only to technology on one side, which is, which is a sophism, or whether uh, the, what we are talking about here is what can be taken to indicate the course of a disease. And that's, that's the debate here. Maybe I can start commenting. But, uh, of course, we have very polarized positions uh, here today. And maybe in real world, uh, we are coming closer. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't think we, need, uh, we can capture everything in just one biomarker. Uh, also, because anyway, uh, in front of the physician is a patient with, um, with a complex disease. And, uh, and 
A mess is also very complex because we don't have a, uh, a very specific uh, protein change, for example, that we can measure or metabolic change. So it's always like a fingerprint. And I'm, uh, and I'm uh, the last one to claim uh, that we can use just one biomarker to capture everything. I do think we need to go uh, in the direction of panels. Uh, and of course, we're dependent on the technology, similar as we are dependent on the, on the cognitive skills that we have. Um, but yeah, um, having them together uh, will, will give a better picture also, and not only the cognitive skills, but also the walking skills, of course. important points here and we purposely left uh, this debate pretty open-ended um, talking about the utility of these markers um, mm -hmm. as a clinical tool so that can include as a diagnostic biomarker a prognostic biomarker or a disease monitoring biomarker and I think both speakers tried to cover you know the broad range of biomarker utilities um, there's two more questions in the audience but um, one of our chairs also has a question so Klaus we'll start with you all right very good um, I just wanted to come back as well to the, uh, to the title of the debate, looking at usefulness. And uh, so uh, I think this can be obviously research, right? So revealing mechanisms or looking at um, a clinical outcome or in fact in clinical practice. And the question really for both of you is um, about acceptance, as it were, of your measures, the measures proposed for things, for example, like treatment change, so for a switch decision, um, which I think both may be still struggling, right? When, when it comes to implementation um, at the moment, as far as I'm aware, um, changes in neurofilament levels, for example, are not certainly not in our um, environment accepted as a measure to you know, trigger a treatment change. And neither, as far as I, I, people may struggle with cognitive change as well as a trigger for that. So maybe you could both comment on, on that. So I'll push back gently against the cognition because um, the Saponomar trial that came out recently did have a cognitive measure in it, the SDMT. And there was a paper in neurology showing that the group that was randomized to saponamide indeed had more than the four point change in SDMT that's considered clinically significant. So, you know, belatedly, I think, Cognition is now working its way into clinical trials. I wish it would have taken place earlier with the interferons, et cetera. But you know, people play cash up and you know, medicine moves slowly. So I think we're now looking at cognition becoming as a very important and significant marker of clinical trials because there's a recognition that this does indeed have real world consequences. That when your cognition fails, you, know, you struggle to work, you struggle to drive, you can't manage your activities of daily living. Um, you know, it's got a predictor value as well. So um, belatedly, the broader neurological profession has woken up to that and we start seeing it as part of clinical trials. And uh, I can uh, comment only on the use of neurofilament light because that's the, the farthest uh, that we're using and uh, it's being implemented in, uh, in Amsterdam to monitor where their uh, extended dosing is still safe. And it's not the only biomarker, it's uh, yeah, a set of biomarkers that look at, is being looked at, uh, but it's, it's part of it. Uh, so it's, it's not only implemented in Amsterdam but in the Netherlands. Um, in, in, in a wider region, um, so, so it's being implemented. But I've seen also the hurdles for implementation, and, uh, and that's uh, also about acceptance, uh, convincing doctors uh, that there is evidence for neurofilament light being used. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite convinced myself that any increase in neurofilament light uh, means something, that there, there is something ongoing in the brain. And whether it's related to M MS or, or uh, stroke, we, we don't know. Um, but, but it's anyway suspicious if you have an increase in uh, neurofilament light. And um, so, so that's um, yeah, wh why it's uh, being used also. And for use in pro uh, monitoring progression, I think the relations are too, too weak for that. Uh, that's statistically interesting and for research, uh, but for that uh, it, it's not at all the, the ideal biomarker. Uh, neither have we go uh, yes, uh, good enough evidence for GFAP, so we have to search further. 
Um, but, but yeah, at the end you need something tangible, like the four-point change in uh, SDMT or eight-point change, and, th and that's something that's then tangible and that you can use. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's about acceptance. And the next hurdle uh, is uh, about refund, and that's uh, a closed door that I'm knocking on <laughs> in our academic hospital still. So we do it in the research context, um, and. Uh, it, it's incredible uh, difficult, and I, I, I think it's similar everywhere, maybe because we don't have many novel biomarker tests uh, that we implement. Uh, that's so difficult to first find the right door to knock on and then uh, to get it opened. Um, and also, t yeah, uh, to find the way to the insurance companies uh, that they refund it. So first within the hospital and next uh, the discussion with uh, insurance companies. Uh, so it's not so easy, but uh, yeah, we, we recently started a program, it's called Urban Diagnostics, to bring such diagnostic tests uh, cl uh, quicker to uh, the primary care. Um, and, uh, and I hope that that will help accelerate these processes. And that, uh, that's the secondary thing, eh? it's not the scientific part, but it's about the, or secondary, it's very important, but uh, refunds. Yeah. Um, we'll just have one more question from the audience, and then our speakers will prepare their closing remarks. Can I, can I ask Professor Feinstein, is the delayed processing what patients are telling me is f uh, fatigue? Oh, great question. Um, fatigue is so complex. I think um, the data show that the processing speed um, is independent of fatigue. Fatigue is a very subjective difficulty. They measure processing speed in the morning and in the later afternoon. Is, is there a difference? The data say probably not. So I think fatigue, we're looking at a, at a different mechanism. There is a cognitive fatigue, undoubtedly as well, that's different from a physical fatigue. But so far, the correlations between what patients tell us in terms of their fatigue and the empirical cognitive results is not a robust correlation. Thank you uh, to both our speakers, um, and uh, we're just going to maybe start with uh, Dr. Feinstein um, with your closing remarks. This is your last push um, to get audience members to change their opinion. How long do I have? Three minutes. <laughs> okay, processing speed. So um, cognition can be measured very easily now. It's standardized. Um, it's quick. It's cheap. It gives you a lot of useful information. It has real-world consequences. It helps you predict what's going to happen in individuals with a clinically isolated syndrome, with relapsing remitting disease. Um, it can predict employment, the ability to drive, manage activities of daily living. Um, we know that cognitive reserve is a protective factor that also gives us a good marker on how people are going to uh, function cognitively. And the most important thing now is that we have treatments for cognitive difficulties. This eponymide study revealed some positive benefits. Um, we've got cognitive rehabilitation, which is emerging as an effective way of helping individuals with cognition. And the final point is this, that we've got our thresholds. We know that a four-point change in the simple digit modality test from a group perspective is clinically significant, and eight point in terms of individual functioning. So for multiple reasons, cognition is a good marker of disease progression and something that you should all put um, the assessment as part of your clinical practice. I'll, all right, Charlotte, uh, three minutes. Um, three minutes? Uh, okay, yeah. Um, so uh, I, I think the most important issue with a disease of the brain and with other neurological diseases is that there is some biology ongoing. And the biology is the cause of the beginning, uh, first preclinical, where we can't measure it yet uh, using our clinical skills. So for that, we need biomarkers uh, to, to track that biology. And there's usually a long preclinical phase of maybe 10 years uh, before we see the clinical symptoms. So there we have to rely on the biomarkers. And also during the progressive phase, there are changes in the biology that underlie this progression. So the best way is to go at the source and track this biology. And the best is, by definition, using biomarkers. So I do think that the biomarkers are the future. Okay, thank you to both our speakers, um, again, for presenting quite compelling arguments um, for both sides. Um, so we're gonna ask the audience again. Um, for the motion, cognitive markers are more useful than biomarkers in MS monitoring, 
Um, please raise your hand up high if you vote for the motion. But just so that we can be complete, for those um, still voting against the motion, please raise your hands up high. So it actually looks almost like it's half and half, but we'll get the, uh, we'll get the official tally. Um, so uh, thank you very much, everybody. That, I think, was very lively and um, interactive, and I think we all learned a lot.